Gosh. You probably read already that Mary Hartley is going to talk about Cornelius Akers. Picture here. Um, uh, who came from Indiana with his family in 1970. Took three months, three wagons, and they got here. No. So it, she has a fun story to tell. I'm just going to tell one thing so I don't interfere with what she has. But in the book, it's, you know, they, they got here in the late summer or fall, so they didn't have time to build a home of any kind. So they had to find a place to stay. And this man by the name of Pember took them in. I assume he was Round Rock. And it says, 14 people shared a 14 by 16 foot cabin that winter. <laughs> it had a dirt floor. Cooking was done over a fire in a fireplace. And boxes were used for tables and chairs. Fortunately, it was a mild winter. <laughs> Can you imagine having that many people in one room like that? They were smaller then. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Mary and she can tell you all about the rest of that. Thank you, Mary. Before I really, oh, whoops, excuse me, get my timer out. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay, so that I don't bore you too long. Um, before I do start into my program, I have something I want you to think about while I'm talking, and that is, do you think you would have had the fortitude to have been an 1870 pioneer? Okay. Well, no, you, you have to hear what, what happened. Uh, there were two congressional acts which affected people coming to Cowley County in the 1860s and 1870s. The Preemption Act of 1841 offered the head of the family, a widow, or a single male over 21 years of age, a one-time opportunity to preempt up to 160 acres of land within the public domain. The statutory preemption price was $1.25 per acre, except in the case of land located within the alternating sections of the railroad land grants. In that case, it would be a preemption price of $2.50 an acre, and you could only get 80 acres. Now, the Homestead Act of 1862, which is what we're really going to talk about, provided an eligible person with up to 160 acres in return for five years residency and an aggregate of $18 for, five, for that five years. Any individual who was a head of the family, or at least 21 years old, or who had performed military duty, could take up a homestead claim under the Homestead Act. A homesteader was required to settle on his claim within six months of filing. And he had to prove up no longer, no uh, over a period of time no longer than seven years. And like preemption, an individual was only entitled to do that one time. Now both of these acts do figure into the stories of settlement in Cali County. I became aware of the word homestead when I was reading a book by Laura Ingalls Wilder. And you will see that there's an illustration up there on that poster from Little House on the Prairie. Little House books by Wilder have captivated generations of children and adults, but you should always read those books as fiction. She did use many stories from her childhood, but her books are only partially autobiographical because her book Little House on the Prairie is set in northern Oklahoma, somewhat near us, and because the Ingalls family were actually 
squatters on land in Kansas within what we know today as the diminished Osage Reserve. It seems logical. They must have homesteaded here. That's not true. It wasn't until they had gone back to their little house of the big woods in Wisconsin and then made their way west following the building of a railroad to South Dakota that Charles Ingalls felt called, to, called upon to be a homesteader. And in her book, By the Shores of Silver Lake, Wilder recounts the story of Paw's walk from Descent to Brookings, South Dakota. She describes the pandemonium of the people who were jockeying for places in line at the land office, and later their anxiety over claim jumpers. In fact, it was that anxiety over the claim jumper, jumpers that caused them to move out to the claim earlier than they had planned to do that year. The opening of the Osage Diminished Reserve to homesteaders was accomplished in 1870, but not without the same kinds of confusing activity that goes on in Congress even today. Multiple bills were proposed, and more than one agreement was reached with the Osage, only to have those arrangements fall apart. At one point, through a bill called the Sturgis Treaty, the Osage were headed toward having the last of their Kansas line be given to a railroad. And that land, if, if they had had that land and if the excess land they sold off to help raise money to build their railroad, it would have been way beyond the needs of the people who were going to homestead. That Turd Sturgis Treaty was named for the railroad's president. And that means that the, the diminished reserve would have gone to the railroad. But it didn't happen. And finally, they got it settled in it so that they could come, so that people could come here and homestead. We all know that E.C. Manning was credited with being the person who bought land for the town of Winfield from the Osage in 1869. Nathan Carter, my grandfather, and Cornelius Akers, my great-grandfather, homesteaded near Rock. <coughs> Nate was a single man when he came to Kansas from New Jersey, and he settled first in the far northeast corner of Kansas before he found his way to Rock. Alas, Nate was one of those unfortunates who had his land stolen by claim jumpers, who accused him of being too young to file on a homestead, an accusation that was not true. His experience was completely different from that of his eventual father-in-law, Cornelius Akers. Just as their experiences were unique to them, the same is true for all the homesteaders. No one it had exactly the same thing happen to them. Some chose land that wasn't well suited for farming. Others had crop failures. Some families had sick, fat, sick children or their children had accidents. And of course, there was the grasshopper deer that came early in their Kansas time in Kansas. Not every family was well suited to the privations of living on a homestead. And you know what? It wasn't just the wives. There were men who were unable to adjust to such a smart wife. And more than one family headed back, faced with another gruesome journey, feelings of failure, and by that time, little money to finance the trip. Now, Cornelius and Susan Akers brought their family from Indiana to Rock in the late summer or early fall of 1870. There were 13 people in their group that consisted, they traveled in two large covered wagons drawn by teams of horses and a smaller uncovered spring wagon pulled by a single horse named John. <laughs> of the 13, nine were members of the Akers family who were still at home with uh, Susan and uh, Cornelius. 
their older daughter, their, their second oldest daughter, had married Henry Rogers in 1860, and the four people in their family traveled with them, and that made the 13 people that were in their, their group. The Akers family were abolitionist Republicans, and their youngest son, Oliver Morton, was named in honor of the abolitionist governor of Indiana, who was later named a U.S. Senator by the Indiana le Legislature. In a family history written by Morton Akers, and he always went by his middle name, he was never Oliver. He describes his father who carried escaping slaves along the Underground Railroad, hidden under loads of hay. Once the 13 arrived in Kansas, the first order of business was finding winter quarters. And I guess that um, Jane has already taken care of telling you about that. Um, a man named J.Q. Pember took them in, and there were those 14 people living in the, the 14 by 16 foot cabin. And that included two young children, keep that in mind. It also included my grandmother. And there's a picture over here on this poster of my grandmother and her children taken in about 1910. And by that time, she had been a widow for about 14 years. Jane mentioned that they cooked, oh, they cooked their food over the fire in the fireplace and they used the boxes that contained their household goods for tables and chairs and they dealt with with a dirt floor. But how did they sleep? Can you imagine all those people lined up on the floor of that? They must have had hammocks. <laughs> well, almost, Julie. They fashioned, they fashioned berths um, suspended between ropes that the top rope, the top of the rope was fastened to the, to the ceiling and the bottom of the rope was fastened to the dirt floor. And then they suspended these beds between the ropes. And each, each one of the birds had a mattress ticking filled with prairie grass. And then they put a feather bed on top of that. I mean, it actually sounds fairly comfortable. <laughs> now, what he doesn't, doesn't say is just how many of those had, those they had. How many people were sharing one of those births? That, that part he didn't go into any details about. Uh, for food, they had wild game and fish. And during the winter, Henry led a couple of the older men in the group, either brothers or his father or maybe even Mr. Pender, on a buffalo hunting excursion west of Rock. He they don't say how far they went. So I'm trying to picture where the buffalo at Udall, where they had Belt Plain. Uh, did they make it as far as Wellington or South Haven? I, I'd like to know where those buffalo were, and he, he doesn't help us with that. But they came back from the buffalo hunt with a, a lot of hind quarters of buffalo, and that's the only thing that they harvested from the buffalo at that time. Uh, they may have brought back some buffalo robes, but, but he doesn't mention it. But um, they, they hung the, the hind quarters in trees on the north side of, of, their, of the cabin. And when they wanted to cook buffalo, one of the men went out with an axe and lopped off a, a piece of buffalo, and they cooked it. Now, one of the things that he didn't tell us about Mr. Pember was did he charge them rent for being in that little cabin? Well, I suspect that maybe he took the men out of the goodness of his heart, but he benefited from that. He was a single man who had been batching in that little cabin, and he all of a sudden had cooks. <laughs> uh, he had Susan Akers, and he had her daughter, uh, Catherine Rogers, and, and some other older daughters to help, and so Mr. Pember probably came out all right in that. Um, the nearest railroad stop at that time was in Emporia. And we think about Emporia, it's not too far away. You know, it's just a little bit up the turnpike. 
But if you were going to go to Emporia from Rock in that time, you needed to help and make a round trip. You needed to give yourself about a week for that. And um, if you wanted to, and we don't know that they ever took the train, but that, that was the nearest train stop. The nearest grist mill was in Augusta. And again, that wasn't, we think that, you know, it's not very far away. Well, if you wanted to go to Augusta to get your grain, grain ground or your corn made into cornmeal, you want to give yourself two days for that. And the same thing was true if you came to Winfield to Mr. Manning's store. He had a two-story brick built, or uh, log building that he had the store in. And he stocked flour and sugar and dried beans. And he also had quinine, which was really important then because fever and ague were something that there was a lot of in that area. And it's kind of like m malaria. And they used the quinine to treat the, the, the fever and ague. At the beginning of 1871, after the land had been surveyed and opened for homesteading, Cornelius Akers filed on a claim. And if you will look at the uh, satellite map that's there, the claim that he filed on is in the lower left-hand corner of the, the uh, uh, land that is shown there. And you'll see that there's a kind of a box or a rectangle that somebody has inked around. In the 20th century, that's where the missile silo was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure that those of you who lived here then will remember that they put the government put a missile silo near Rock and that there was a very bad fire later on. Um, I, I missed all of that. <coughs> um, after they moved to their claim, of course, one of the things you had to do was, was build a house and, um, shelter of some kind. So he built a one-room house with a loft. 